Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Buckingham Arena. It's our final matchup of day four of the round robin action. And it's the Toronto Marlies taking on the Guelph Griffins on Rogers TV. Hello, everybody. Bill tonight is Peter Curtis. Peter, well, for these two teams, they're in. They're going to the quarterfinals, but there are still implications to be had. Winner of this wins the division. For the Guelph Griffins, they seem to be a team that knows how to get it done in these sort of one-and-done type of games. They did it to get to the, champi to the championship uh, series in their league, and then they did it again in the wild card game to get here uh, in this section now, and then they've just been picked up their play at the right time. Well, this is their opportunity, and they've been led by a cast of characters here. One of the big ones we'd like to see is Austin Keating. He's an underager, meaning we're going to see him next year if Guelph can get back to the OHL Cup, and he hasn't looked out of place. He's them in scoring at the tournament, was third on the team in scoring, and he's a dynamic offensive player. And you're wearing 89, you better be pretty good when you got the puck on your stick. All right, and for the Toronto Marlies, we know what they're capable of. They were the finalists in the GTHL, losing to the Toronto Junior Canadiens. And that guy there, though, Michael McLeod, expect a lot of offense to be generated off his speed, off his stick. Well, he's a big guy who can carry the puck like most players of his ilk. He can take it one step farther, and he's a great puck handler and loves to shoot the puck as well. This guy can do it at both ends of the ice. All right, Division 3 will be decided after a quick commercial break. Don't go anywhere. Marley's Griffins, Rogers TV. All right, welcome back to the Palace. And we're moments away from Huck Drop. We've got a lot to talk about throughout this broadcast. We have a lot of teams confirmed now to be headed to the quarterfinals. Still one spot left to be determined in Division Four. As you take a look at the Marlies getting ready, they look to be the only team, if they can get a win here, that would potentially be undefeated in the round robin portion of the OHL Cup. The Ottawa Junior 67s are currently bat battling the Junior Canadian, so if they win, they would join them in that territory, but we'll have to wait and see. But for the Guelph Griffins, I mean, you talk about a team who, they had a mediocre season. They finished sixth, and then the Omeche, they made it to a winner in the playoffs. They led themselves to a winner-take-all to make the championship round where they would beat Brampton in a one-game playoff. They wouldn't make it out of the Omeche playoffs, unfortunately, if you're a fan of theirs, but then they come to the OHL Cup, and then they win a big wild-card game. So if you talk about pressure situations, this is a team that's putting it together at the right time of the year and getting the results. And they're into the quarterfinals based on how the tiebreakers would rule out. And right now, if they beat the Marlies, they could be the high seed in this division. So that gives you a game against a lower seed from another division in the final group of eight. And missing in action for the Griffins. No Farrow, no Chatterson at the back end. And the Marlies as well have a few injuries to, that they are dealing with. Blaze and Wong are sidelined as as well. Blake Coffey not in the lineup either. So every team in this tournament has their fair share of injuries and scratches, just a part of the game. But both of these teams, as we mentioned, will be going to the quarterfinals, so they've figured out a way to play through it. One of the challenges that you have in a tournament like this is you come through a pretty tough playoff. It doesn't matter if it's the GTHL that went eight games in the final, or of course the OMHAs where you have your regionals and then what is essentially the championship tournament the weekend before the OHL Cup. And there was a shot stopped by Rabito, who gets the call. Casimir Kroll was in the net earlier today when the Toronto Marlies were victorious. That was a matchup against the Waterloo Wolves. A 6-1 to one victory. So the Marlies, as we mentioned, have been undefeated as Sicoli almost took a shoulder there at the center ice area. The, they beat the Admirals 3-1, the Elite Hockey Group 4-3, and the Waterloo Wolves 6-1 this morning. So Kroll was in the net at that time, but no slouch either. Justin Rubito gets the call, who during the regular season had 15 wins, three shutouts, and a sparkling 1.63 goals against average. Both teams going with their second goalie, but really a 1A kind of thing going at both ends as Rob Stacy makes his first big save of the game. 
And you need this depth. I mean, you saw with the Toronto Maple Leafs in their recent game against the LA Kings, needing some goaltending depth. And this is how the teams get to the OHL Cup Final. If you're going to ride one goalie or a number one line or a big centerman, that's not enough to get the job done to qualify for a tournament with 20 of the best teams here from North America. Especially when you have the potential of two games in a single day. So you'd like to be able to throw both your keepers in there with confidence. And both of these teams possess that depth at the back end as that's thrown out in front, looking to bat that out of the air was Cody Knapp as Thomas Setti comes out from behind his net. And it's stopped at the point. And the Griffins look to keep it going. And here comes McLeod. He was our guy to watch. You don't want to give him too much speed. Over to Radish. He's got all kinds of space and he scores. Taylor Radish off a beautiful feed from Michael McLeod. And just like that, the Toronto Marlies have taken an early lead. And for Radish, give him eight points now in the tournament. Five for McLeod. And that puts Radish right up at the top of the list here. And you look at that replay. He made no mistake going forehand on that semi little mini breakaway if you'd call it that. We'll talk about way too much time for two very skilled players. And remember, Radish was leading the GTHL regular season in points and just an overall great two-way player before he got injured and he is now getting back into that game shape. He did come back in the playoffs, but you know it takes a little while to get over an injury and it looks like he's there. There's a blast from O'Grady kicked out. You want to talk about two-way players. This line right now for the Marlies can score but they play so well at both ends of the ice in Mizzy, Harrison, Pooh. And Harrison, Pooh are two guys in the playoffs especially. We knew they were over point per game players in the regular season, what they're capable of. But in the playoffs and in that final against the Junior Canadiens, we saw them elevate their game to a whole new level. Well, it just showed that the Junior Canadiens, a lot of people like ourselves, thought it'd be a blowout in the finals. And the Marlies really stepped up, made it a very competitive eight-game series. And in that 6-1 victory early t earlier today over the Wolves, Taylor Radish had three points, as did Maximovich. McLeod had two. So those are, those are three of the big gunners in the GTHL. They were two, three, and four, respectively, in league scoring. A total combination, or combined, rather, of 162 points between those three players. So offensively, those are the three to watch out for. As Sickley looking for it. It's in his pants. So he'll... Have to hang on, but Radish is continuing his hot streak from earlier this morning. A and lot of the action in the schedule. You can get it all on the Ontario Hockey League website. They've got an OHL Cup section. And if you're in the Toronto area, folks, the admission is not, there's no admission gate, so you can get into this building for free. Saturday, quarterfinals and semis, and of course the finals, Sunday, 1 o'clock, and that's all on Rogers TV. There's a wraparound opportunity. Nice job by Rabito to get the right pad up against the post and keep that one out. It's shot right back in by the Griffins. And there's Duchesne, who will fire this one into the zone, and he'll head off for a change. A few call-ups as well for the Marlies. They've got Elijah Roberts, Quinn Hughes, and Duchesne as well, as you saw moments ago, fire that one into the zone. And Josh, Josh Chicha, would be the lone call up for the Guelph Griffins. Now Hunter fires this one in. One nothing lead off a goal by Taylor Radish. There's a two on one with Mike McLeod. They're out there right now alongside Maximovich. You wanna talk about it. a firing squad right there. Those three, as we mentioned, all the damage they did throughout the league. Here comes McLeod with a head of steam. Wins the brace for the puck. He still has it. Still has it on his stick. McLeod brings it out. Cross ice for Roberts. His shot gets through but goes wide. There's Thomas Setti. Wraps it around down low. And Radish battles with a couple of Griffins. McPherson. Maximovich comes out with it. Fires it wide. There's Knapp battling with a much bitter, bigger McLeod. Who finds Radish. He's got a lot of time to just in that high slot top of the circle to turn around, set up shop, and get a shot off. There's another chance, Maximovich. That one stopped also, and I believe a fortunate break perhaps for the Griffins as the net came off. But that line for the Marlies just circling, and the Griffins a little discombobulated, a term I like to use in their own end. Certainly the time of possession in this first five minutes and 11 seconds heavily favoring the Toronto Marlies. Rob Stacey's gonna be very busy. 
It's just surprising. Guelph was just kind of standing still like they were killing a penalty. We're trying to count. There were five red shirts out there, but they were not engaging the Toronto Marlies. It was just watching them skate around the perimeter. And it's cleared out now by the Griffins. Who their journey to this stage. A little different from the Marlies as that backhander stopped. They had to win the wild card just to make it in. But they really upset some teams. 4-1 victory over the Waterloo Wolves. 5-2 loss to the elite team out of the U.S. And the Admirals, they beat 2-1 as well. So, I mean, you look at the Griffins, they beat the Alliance champs and the OMHA finalists. Here's a chance the other way. That's stopped by Rubito. A nice quick reaction there. And Bunham in the power forward left all alone a great little pass. And Guelph being very opportunistic right here. Really the first quality scoring opportunity in six minutes of action. And the goaltender, Rabito had to be very good. And one, under ga one other game currently in the third period. It's the Ottawa Junior 67s taking on the Toronto Junior Canadiens. The JRC are up 3-2 in a must-win game for them. In fact, if they take this one over the Ottawa Junior 67s, they will win Division One in what looked to be its sole possession of the way the 67s were playing. It looked to be all theirs. Well, with that will mean the Junior 67s will get in on the quarterfinal as well. So if you're watching in the Ottawa area, you've been well represented, and you're going to have at least one team make it into the final eight. And we'll have... A bunch of graphics and standings and updates for you during our second intermission break to get you up to speed. But we can tell you that the Alliance champions in the Wolves and the OEMHL champions in the Ottawa Valley Titans both will not be headed to the quarterfinals. And it, we'll see what happens here with the Junior Canadiens. I mean, your GTHL champions are also on the brink. And as every broadcast we've mentioned, it just goes to show you the parody in this tournament and how great the competition has been and what talent has been in this year's draft class. Well, you know, it's it's always amazing because this is their last year as a team. So a lot of people are thinking it's just for the scouts. But you know what? It's for the players as well. Usually these players have been together at this level. They get the opportunity for one last chance at the OHL Cup. Think about it. You could be eliminated in your playoffs and still have a championship to go to. And this is the one last chance to win a championship in minor hockey because there's definitely a draft class here. You will see players. You take a game program from this tournament, there will be players in Plenty the OHL. It's definitely in the draft aspect. We've talked about all the big forwards. But you, sir, Mr. Knice, have noticed the class of defensemen this year might be the best that's been in the last couple of years. Well, they've got great size, great skating ability, mobility, and that hockey IQ on at least several players we've seen throughout the tournament. Of course, there's no Chick Run or Mete or two of the big ones for the Junior Canadiens. As the Griffins come out, quick shot, loose puck, and they score! And I believe that was number 19, Connor Bunneman, who puts that one home on the power play for the Griffins, a power play which was deadly in the regular season. It was at a 38.1% success rate, which is a big time number there in that department, and they show us why. Iacocca shields the puck there. He doesn't let the defenseman near him. Puts it on net, and Bunneman, he knows that spot very well, and he's able to give it that little poke to get across the goal line. And Guelph gets that power play. You look up at the scoreboard, it's a 1-1 game, and they're back in it. They just need to play a little bit more 50-50 hockey here. You don't want to be in your end for, all the, for most of the game against a team like the Toronto Marlies. And that'll be the challenge here. There's a good vibe on that Guelph bench now. Now you got to make sure you play a little bit of the game at the other end as well. And going back to that point, because I know you love the defenseman, being a former defenseman yourself, Peter Curtis, but the skating ability and the smarts and the skill, not just the chick runs and the metes, but you look at a guy like Jonathan Schaefer on the Hamilton Junior Bulldogs. Uh, you had Owen Grant, the captain of the Ottawa Valley Titans, was definitely... A name to be throwing out there, Reed Yoakum. We saw him earlier today for the Southern Tier Admirals. So just a quality draft class for defenseman Cole Candela. We had the privilege of seeing him all year on the Vaughn Kings. A lot of big names. It will be interesting to see how many defensemen are drafted in that first two rounds of the OHL draft. Now, a lot of teams want to draft that offense. Hey, a kid can shoot the puck, score some goals. You need that. But if you're going to win a championship, you need it at the back end with your goaltending. I could see that 
defenseman might be the most called out position you see in the first two rounds. Well, last year from Oakville, Matthew Spencer, their captain went early in the OHL draft. And I mean, you get the you get the results quicker when you draft a forward. They can translate to the next level and they can put up those points. It takes a little bit longer with defensemen, but it's definitely worth the wait if you give them some time to develop as a player, to grow their hockey instincts, especially, I know it sounds crazy, but more defensively in their own end. These guys are used to going for skates and playing offensive. It's the commitment to playing in your own end. Well, you're 16 going into the OHL against 17, 18, 19, and 20 year olds. So that's why defensemen struggle a little bit more. That's why you sometimes see a goalie, as you see Sokoli get involved, that's why you see sometimes a goalie go down and play a, a midget AAA season or maybe a season in the OJHL or Junior B, depending on where you're on the world, because we know the Junior B on the western side of the province is one of the best. So that's just the maturity process of being drafted is one thing, doing well in the OHL is another. So there's still a little bit of work to go after the OHL draft for these players. One player, though, who might be ready to rock in the OHL, Logan Stanley of the Waterloo Wolves, clocking in at six foot six, 205 pounds at the age of 15. You know, if he gave me a few inches, then you wouldn't have to make so many height cracks all the time. No, I mean, He's the one of the few guys that I have to look up to. I'm not the biggest guy, but looking at him on the ice, he skates like a forward. He doesn't skate like a choppy defenseman. He's already got the skating down pat, and he's already that tall. And it's cleared down now by the Griffins. Not enough for icing. Tomasetti will leave it there for Elijah Roberts. And it's shot right back in by the Griffins. Tied at one. We had offsetting penalties along the way during that last whistle. So play remains five on five. Less than five to go, McLeod. Little move to put the puck up to the front of his stick. And here come the Griffins the other way. Two on two rush. Man left all alone in front. Great passing and they score! That's Austin Keating. And two of our guys we decided to spotlight at the start of this game. In McLeod and Keating, they both made an impact early on, but that's just some beautiful passing and a missed coverage by the Marley. Saw both guys go after the puck carrier that left two players alone in front of the net. Well, that's hand in hand. That's just not how the Marleys have played defense this year. And you leave anyone alone like that in front of your goaltender and give them the opportunity to pass to a late trailing Austin Keating, who like we said, he's an underager. He's not available this year to the OHL teams. He'll hopefully be at the OHL Cup next year, depending on how strong the next generation of Griffins are. And one can only imagine he'll continue to grow as a player and become that much more of a force. But like you said, Peter, third in scoring on the team with 31 points during the regular season. And he does not look out of place as Mizzy fires that backhand wide. Oh, there's a big hit by Harris in the corner. And O'Grady keeps the play going. Throws it on net. And that's blocked by the Griffins and they're fire, they'll fire that one down. We'll have an icing call with 4.13 to go. Bunneman and Keating for the Griffins. Radish for the Marlies. Talk about a period where the Marlies come out strong. They figure, let's get something going early. They get the goal. It looks like Guelph's gonna play a lot in their own zone and that power play. Get them on the board and then Guelph with a little bit of speed. Like we said, the winner of this division gets to be that high seed against a lower seed and from another division. So there's a lot here at stake for both of these teams. Even though they both know they've qualified, you want to be the top seed. And Rabito will come out and leave that there for Duchesne. And here come the Marlies the other way. McLeod with speed and just pushed offside. On the far side was Keladitis, and I'm sure they're happy, though, to have a guy like Keladitis back in their lineup. They were missing him. They were missing a little bit of the speed of Mizzy during the GTHL playoffs, but the Marley slowly but surely got more healthy as the playoffs went along. It's sometimes opposite, for example, of what the Junior Canadians have gone through. The Marleys were missing Mizzy and Keladitis for a bit in the finals. They're in the lineup, they look strong. Of course, the Junior Canadians missing two of the best defensemen in the OHL draft class with Chikrit and Mete being out of the lineup. So it's been a bit of a challenge for the JRC on the other side, but it looks like they may have been able to 
pulled off Ottawa Valley. It was three to two when we sneaked a peek on the other pad just recently. It remains three to two with less than two minutes to go in that game. So we'll keep you posted. Here comes Biles. One on three, Robert strips him of the puck. And it's fired back in. However, the Griffins will head for a change. All three forwards will come out fresh as Tomasetti skates it out. Mara and Mizzy, they collide. Mara pokes the puck free. Ayakoko. Oh, there's a hit. Harris is throwing his weight around. He just picked up his game in the GTHL playoffs, and he hasn't missed a beat here at the OHL Cup. And Mara is skating off gingerly right now after that hit from Harris, so we'll keep an eye on him. Sent back to the point. That would be Hughes who has it. Back to O'Grady, shot gets through just wide. Ayakoko. I had my Coco Chris this morning, it's Iacocca. Excuse me. Well for Guelph, they're finding a way in this period to just kind of fall into that passive defensive zone coverage. Take a look folks, I mean, the Marlies aren't on a power play and they're trying to work the puck down low. It looks like the Marlies have a chance to try and make this a three on three battle below the face off circles because Guelph's done a good job of keeping the points guarded so really it's a battle between two defensemen and a centerman on Guelph versus the three forwards there for the Marlies and play is whistled down there will be a penalty it coming up a trip in the corner and I believe that dangerous Guelph Griffins power play will get one more opportunity they already struck their one for one and this will be their second look as Sicoli heads to the box It'll be a tripping call there, and Guelph would, like we said, get the opportunity. It's a little hard work right there, but you see a little bit of a hold, a little bit of a leg kick right there, so good call by the official Ken Van Dyke. He's working the game with fellow referee Chris Ferreira, and on the lines, Adam Madonic and Jeff Katzman. Draws one by the Griffins. That was Finoro. He led the Griffins in scoring. He had 37 points during their regular season. Oh, and there's a big time hit. And slow to get up and skating right now, slowly back into his own end, his main prize. He was looking for the puck in the air. You can't fault him. He's on the power play, he wants to get that puck, get it in movement. And he realized You've got to look up and look down every now and then as well. It's like a center fielder. You've got to know where you're standing in the middle of the field. And he looks like he's still a little shaken up after that hit. Well, play continues. Power play has a minute 10 to go. Good read by Tomasetti in the neutral zone to send that right back into the Griffins' end. Bunneman. He opened up the scoring, throws it in front. He was looking for Keating. Coming off a change with speed is Cameron and he takes out his man. Forgets about the puck though and now Harris and Radish on a shorthanded rush. Harris, oh look out, he almost got clipped there. Got his head up at the last second. Then a one-timer stopped by Stacy. Well, some big hits for two teams that want to stay injury free and of course suspension free. You're both moving on to the playoffs but I can tell you right now, I get the vibe here. They both want the win. They're not looking to back into the next round. And they try to get something set up as we've got 20 seconds to go in the first period. And we've got a final for you out of that JRC Junior 67s game. 3-2 victory for the Junior Canadiens who will take Division I. And the Junior 67s will also be headed to the quarterfinal with them. We will have an updated standings board and everything after our second intermission break but right now let's focus on our first intermission and both teams we know the offense that they're capable of putting up the Marlies had 180 goals scored in 33 regular season games but a nice job by the Griffins I mean you talk about a sleeper team I don't know if anyone had them coming out 
of even the wild card game, perhaps, and that's no insult to the Griffins, just how competitive it has been top to bottom. But the Griffins have surprised a lot of people in this tournament, and we're seeing why right here. So when do you go from being a sleeper surprise team to one of the teams that deserve to be here? I mean, the highlights will show us that the Marlies had a lot of the action going on, but it was the Guelph Griffins offense that got going. And that's been the surprise story of the first period here. As we head to our highlights, you'll see that the Marlies had the chance to get something going early. We saw the goal. We saw Radish and McLeod working together. And it was just that Guelph power play that all of a sudden woke up the offense. Yeah, early on, like you said, this was the opportunity when McLeod to Radish, two guys, you don't want to allow a two on O essentially to. It was a two on one after the pass by McLeod brought Radish in all alone. And then a few collisions, things getting a little bit physical in that first period of play. But like you said, Peter, it was the power play that got things going for the Griffins. That was Keating with an opportunity. He's looked good so far here today. Maximovich with that one timer. That was a nice stop by Stacy. And there's Ayakoka setting things up, and that would lead to your first goal. That came off the stick of Bunneman. Back to our live action here. And the one interesting aspect, and we're joking around about when does this team get some respect, even now, it's still people saying, wow, that Guelph Griffiths team playing really well. But you know what? You made a great point about how they got into the OMHA regionals and the finals. They've been playing well for a, at least a couple months now. It was just maybe their regular season stats you look at and say they're somewhat flat. But at the end of the day, you keep track of where this team has been from February 1st. They deserve to be here. Oh, most definitely. They were 2014 and six during the regular season. Like we mentioned, that's good for sixth. But all these one and done games that they've been winning, I mean, these guys have been playing through high pressure situations and it's resulted with a lot of success. So I'd have to think in games such as this, they're probably coming to this with a pretty calm mentality as there's a stop by Rabito Once again, we're back to five on five. Sicoli chips it ahead for Kelly Knight. It's great pass, even better save by Rob Stacy getting across and stretching out the body. Huge save there on a nice little pass and play by the two Marlies forwards. Well, Aditus looked like he thought that was going to hit the back of the net. Wasn't even ready for the rebound. And that was just the goaltender getting across with a little bit of height as well. The puck had some elevation, and Stacy kept it out of the back of the net. And now the Marlies trying to get it out again. It's kept in, though. Bunneman has it. Oh, nice little toe drag. It comes to his teammate. They score! Giordano Finoro with goal number three for the Griffins. And we were talking about the Griffins deserving a little bit of respect. Well, they're coming in right now and handing it to the Marlies early on. Three quick goals, and they've got the three to one lead now in the with 13.44 to go in the second period. That is just a great play by Bunneman. Well, the puck doesn't get out, and Bunneman, like we said, we kind of refer to him as a power forward, but you've seen his puck distribution skills on this line. And you're right, partner. The Toronto Marlies are down 3-1, to one and Guelph definitely deserving the two-goal lead just based on the offensive skill we've seen. And an offside. Oh, that would have had Maximovich in a sniper's position right there in front of Stacy. Fortunately, if you're a fan of the Griffins, an offside call. But the Griffins, I don't think they should sit back here, slow down the pace at any given point, because we know what the Marlies can do when it comes to scoring goals, and this one could easily be 3-3 in the blink of an eye. Well, this might be fun, because the Marlies know they're going into the quarterfinals with this 12th team, so they might just open it up here to try and get into the game, so we might be looking at one of those high-scoring affairs by two teams that definitely have the offense to have a little bit of fun here on Rogers TV. A little bit of fun, nothing to lose per se. Both teams are going to the court finals, but still they'd like to finish atop the division. And we'll get a power play now for the Toronto Marlies as there is a hold in the corner. I believe it's going to be an interference call to, it looks as though it'll be Keating. So we'll get to see the dangerous Marlies in their depth on forward and on, and on offense get to work now with an extra man out there. Coffee's not in the lineup. Of course, Blake Coffee, the son of Coach Paul Coffee. For those who haven't seen him, he doesn't play like that. He's definitely got puck control skills, but he's a bruising, tough-nosed defenseman who also happens to play on the power play. So this will be the challenge for the Marlies power play as they've got Duchesne here with the puck as the Bantam call-up 
getting some prime power play opportunity. And for Blake Coffey as well, he does a nice job of when he's quarterbacking at the point, he gets the shot off. There's a look at his the head coach, Paul Coffey, his father. He gets those slap shots off and he keeps them low. They're very tippable always and they always safe kick shots. out big rebounds. Absolutely, safe shots that forwards have no problem standing in front of the net. They know that there's gonna be a shot that gets around the point person because that's important. You don't want it blocked and then something that can get to the net. And Blake Coffey, there's a shot by Duchesne. Big rebound. Radish has it. There, it's back out to Duchesne again, over to Cairns. And Blake Coffey may not put up as many points as his father, but he scored some timely goals in the GTHL playoffs. Especially when the Marlies looked to be in trouble against the Mississauga Senators in their second round. There was a last minute goal by Blake Coffey that tied up a game. That really could have been a series Difference maker as McLeod's shot gets deflected and goes up high. A nice job playing the body there by Ayakoka. And now Radish has it. Back for Cairns. Cairns spent some time playing forward. There's a shot by Duchesne. Looking forward to Stacy, and he finds it before the Marlies do. Karen's back there. He played some time at forward, so it's almost like you have four forwards. He did a respectable job filling in when there were some injuries, but you know where they like to have him. They're more confident, of course, having him as a defenseman. Well, that was a good decision. He had Duchesne open with the lane, and the big big thing you see in hockey this day at every level is the point men come out to block those shots, and defensemen who want to just blast away, they run the risk of having it bounce off the shin pads and end up in a breakaway, especially when they're on a power play. There's a shot, loose puck, Poo puts it home. And a power play goal for the Marlies now. So both teams have struck with the man advantage. And that's Cliff Poo right on the doorstep. And he puts home his fourth point of the tourney. And it brings the Marlies to within one. Goaltender Stacey, he's already seen a lot of shots.